Welcome to Untold Stories of Innovation, where we amplify untold stories of insight, impact, and innovation. Powered by Untold Content, I'm your host, Katie Trout Taylor. Our guest today is Laura Marino. She is Senior Vice President of Product at Lever and a board member of Leading Women in Technology. Laura, I am so grateful to have this conversation with you today, and thank you for being here. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. So tell us about your personal story of innovation and how you got started. Um, I have been leading product teams in large and small software companies in Silicon Valley for many years, but my personal story began a while ago when I was a young woman in Colombia, and I decided to study civil engineering. Civil engineering is a pretty technical, very male-dominated career, and I was one out of only four women in my class. But I am the fifth child in a family of seven children with only one boy and six girls. <laughs> and my parents always raised us with the expectation that we would all be professionals. I had sisters, in one is a doctor, two architects, engineers. So for wow. me, going into civil engineering seemed very natural. Um, so after I graduated from civil engineering in Colombia, I came to the U.S. to get a master's degree at Stanford University. And I then went on to work for nine years in civil engineering, but developing software models for reservoir operations. And then I realized that really the software industry is where the exciting innovation was happening. And I wanted to move into the software industry. So I essentially took our family savings. My husband was very supportive. I pretty much left him being a single parent of our five-year-old son and our three-year-old daughter. And I went back full-time uh, to Stanford for another degree, this time in management science and engineering, which allowed me to then move into the software industry. And uh, I started working in different companies, and I have uh, experience in broad range of technologies from speech recognition uh, to customer relationship management to HR technology. But as I moved uh, along in my career, I really could see how underrepresented women and minorities were in technology. So um, I started making an effort to build balanced teams and mentor women and encourage women to be in technology and take bigger roles. Um, I've been in companies where I had to build teams, so I had the chance to start promoting that. And then four years ago, uh, I joined the board of Leading Women in Technology, which is a nonprofit dedicated to helping women develop the skills that they need to advance into leadership roles. And uh, two years ago, I joined Lever. It's a company that is developing software to help organizations attract and recruit talent, but it's what's wonderful about Lever is that it's a very diverse company. Our CEO is a woman. We have about 50% of managers are women, 40% of engineers are women. And um, what is great about Lever is that the product itself, as we build the product to help organizations scale their teams, we are also providing functionality to help them build more balanced, more diverse teams. Absolutely. Diversity and inclusion is such a central aspect of your whole story from a personal and a professional standpoint. I That image of you as a young college student being uh, one of only four women and then the image of you uh, depending on, you know, being able to depend on your husband to care for young children while you focused on this new career pathway and, and now you being in a role of mentoring women, it's incredibly inspiring. Um, I'd love to hear more about Lever and why diversity and inclusion matter to recruitment, matter to innovation more broadly as well. Well, I do believe that innovation is a team sport. You really need a team to get the ideas and develop those ideas to make them a reality. And diverse teams can have a lot more innovation because when you're combining people that have different backgrounds, that they come from different cultures, that have different experiences, 
what you have is a team that can look at problems and how to solve them in a much more comprehensive and more creative way. And bringing those uh, new ideas to market also is helped by having diverse people who understand different parts of the market because they may represent different groups with different challenges and different interests. So I do think that for companies, Having diverse teams is not just the right thing to do, is the smart thing to do from a business perspective. And uh, Lever, uh, from the very beginning, the founders really founded a company that was meant to be very diverse across all angles. So we have people from different cultures, uh, different gender orientations, uh, different geographies. And uh, it's a wonderful experience because you really learn a lot from uh, being exposed to people who had different experiences than the one you had. Um, so as we've built the software to really help companies uh, attract the talent, which is now one of the most challenging and strategic um, priorities for companies, yes. the talent market right now is very, very competitive. Um, it has changed a lot from where it was 10, 15 years ago, where people would stay in a company for 10 years where companies just would post a new job posting and people would apply to them. Now it's really uh, much more competitive. People stay at companies for a shorter period of times. Companies need to be hiring all the time and they need to be reaching out to people who may not be applying to their job postings. So we've built software that really helps those companies manage the end-to-end -end talent relationship from establishing a relationship with people who may not have considered the company to attracting them to bringing them on board and eventually resurfacing people who at one point might have had a conversation with the company and were not hired but already have a relationship and what we also do is provide the customer our customers with the ability to also track the diversity of this funnel of people that they are bringing in and attracting to track the diversity and their goals in terms of bringing more diversity to different departments or to different locations and be able to report on that because then they can be much more specific as where they target their efforts to source and attract people. And uh, so it is really uh, something that we feel we're helping companies in both ways, really helping them attract more people, but also attract more diverse teams. In some of the conferences that I've attended around diversity and inclusion in different sectors and innovation, I'm thinking of one in particular I attended recently on uh, diversity and inclusion in healthcare innovation. There was a lot of conversation around uh, accountability and why it's so challenging for organizations to um, really walk the walk and not just talk the talk around around metrics and really putting goals in place and then being holding themselves accountable to those goals uh, to create more diverse teams and to have more diverse individuals rise into leadership positions. And so what I love about the innovation work that you're doing is uh, you're you're sort of inserting that accountability uh lever, if you will, <laughs> forgive the bad pun, <laughs> but you're, you know, you're inserting that into, uh, into a software solution that is already so needed when it comes to recruitment and retention of, of talent, but you're also using that power for a specific purpose and then giving organizations an opportunity to, to, to have visibility around those goals. It's so incredibly important. Absolutely. We also try to be very much a thought leader in this space because, as I said, Lever itself is a fabulous example of what a diverse company looks like. Um, so we do have a lot of kind of thought leadership um, that we try to share with our customers and with the industry in general. About how to go about it. Yes. But, and really, again, walking the walk, being able to say, we, we've implemented this ourselves and here's how we've done so. In a cross-cultural team, in a highly diverse team with people of different nationalities and cultural backgrounds, how does storytelling and story sharing work? Do you think it's more important or less important in an organization that is diverse? I think that storytelling is important in every organization. I don't think that there is 
too much of a difference. I think, though, that your ability to tell a compelling story is going to be increased by having a diverse team, because that team will be able to help tell a more complete story. So the way I think of innovation, innovation is essentially bringing a new idea to reality that's going to improve something. Innovation can be in new products, but it also can be in processes. But what is critical is not just to have an idea, is to have an idea that actually becomes a reality. And that requires buy-in. And that's where storytelling becomes so incredibly powerful because storytelling not only allows people to communicate the idea in a way that is compelling, but it also allows people to get the buy-in from the team that needs to help make that idea a reality. If they can see what the benefit of bringing that idea to reality is, if they can empathize and relate to the benefits that this idea is going to bring, they will be more willing to be part of making it a reality. And I think that that's where storytelling has a huge opportunity. And of course, if you have a diverse team, your ability to tell the story in a way that's compelling to a broader set of people is going to be stronger. Absolutely. One of the topics that we cover in our innovation storytelling workshops is empathy. And we've analyzed thousands of different innovation stories and saw empathy as a key driver. If you if your innovation story doesn't elicit or utilize empathy, then it's going to miss the mark. And one of the functional uh, ways that we bring empathy into our innovation stories is to really use it to check our assumptions. And I, I think that's where getting multiple voices and multiple perspectives at the table when you're trying to figure out which which way to speak to the impact or the evidence that your solution matters or that your uh, interesting concept or new product matters is to pull in different voices, empathize with them, and, and show that diversity as a way of checking some of the assumptions that, that we first have when we try to craft our innovation story. Absolutely. And the reality is that the market now is very global. Even here in the U.S., you have such range of people and cultures that you really need to be building a story that's compelling to the entire market, not just to the people who think like you and look like you. And that's where kind of having a diverse team helps from the very beginning. Internally, tell me more about your process of getting buy-in and what that looks like when there are many different perspectives um, and, and everyone's trying to sort of make sure they're speaking the same language, as it were, with the other people inside of your startup. Well, uh, one of the things that we find very powerful is telling the story also from the perspective of our customers. What we're trying to do is build uh, software, build tools that are going to help our customers. So it's very important to get the whole team a little bit in the shoes of our customers. Uh, we recently had our sales kickoff and we were I was sharing uh, some of the things we're doing in the product that's innovative. And the way that I ended up introducing one of the things that we're doing that's new was telling the story of one of our customers who's today facing uh, challenges with their processes for recruiting because uh, they have a complex process. And so the way for me to introduce how exciting it is that what we're doing is going to help this person was to first tell the story of his pain points. What is it that he's struggling with? Why is it that for him and for his team, the current situation is not great? Once you have the team kind of in those shoes, then you can share, but this is what we're going to be doing next. And this is how what we're doing next is going to enable them to address those pain points. Then you really have the team now much more focused on what we're doing is really helping our customers. And that's what is going to be most exciting for the team to really move forward and get this work done. So I think that really being able to tell the story from the perspective of the customer was very powerful. Yes. And to me, what's so powerful about that example, too, is that it was coming from you. 
as an organizational leader, you were demonstrating how to tell an innovation story that puts the customer's voice at the front of it. And so then you're modeling that. And that's another power of story telling and story sharing. It's it's not just that uh, we're actually using that technique to make an innovation make sense or matter to someone, but we're also then using it to create internal cultures that continue to do that same thing. So hearing you as an innovation leader speak to your product development teams and, and to other people inside the organization by using that strategy, now they are empowered to think in those same ways and incorporate the voice of the consumer and customer into all of their narratives. And I think that's such an important strategy. I'm so glad you brought that up for increasing buy-in and helping people remember the mission and align their individual efforts with the organization's larger vision and goals. Right. The other strategy that works um, is to make sure, and depending on kind of what you're trying to present, what you're trying to get uh, the audience to relate to, but I have um, quite a bit of experience scaling startups and startups that are transitioning from what I call the early stage and are starting to see fast growth, they really need to go through a lot of changes and those changes are difficult. And I have been invited to give uh, some presentations. I was in the Women in Product Conference talking to a group of women product leaders, um, telling them a little bit about what to expect, what those changes are. And what I could see resonating was I was describing based on my experience and based on experience from other companies, very much what they were facing. And then I was trying to explain to them what type of changes they needed to be prepared for as they get their organization and the company ready for scaling. And uh, what was very uh, rewarding for me was at the end of the presentation, I had several people come to me saying, oh my God, you were describing my world. You were describing my day-to-day life right yes. now in my company that is starting to go through that. So being able to tell the story in a way that people can relate to, that they can understand, that they can see themselves in that situation, then you can bring them along more easily into it. So now be prepared. These are the things that you're going to need to start doing now so that you're ready for this stage that your company is entering. But if you don't get them kind of to relate at the beginning of where they are, you may not be able to bring them on that journey. Could you bring an example or two to life from that uh, presentation? Oh, sure. So when you think of startups and if uh, you're in Silicon Valley, everybody talks about moving fast, iterating, testing. Well, that works fine when you're a very early startup. You have a small group of people. They talk to each other all the time. Um, the engineering team is just focused on getting new things out. You have a couple of early uh, customers who are willing to try things, and that allows you to move very quickly. That's part of the strategy that companies have in that early stage to get to what we call product market fit. But once the company has secured initial success, now you have a product that has resonated in the market, and all of a sudden you're getting a lot more customers. You have a lot more people. Your your company is growing. Now you're not 20 people or 50 people. Now you're 100 or 150, that kind of informal way of doing things doesn't work anymore. Communication that used to be very agile when you were small completely starts breaking down when you have uh, 150 people versus 20. Uh, So you need to start doing things like putting in in place more processes. And process is a bad word for some young startups. (laughs) I mean, there's this idea of process is slow, is going to slow us down. But as you face this fast growth, if you don't put some processes in place, you're just going to end up in pure chaos. Uh, And I think that when I talk a little bit about how the evolution of the communication that was very agile starts getting chaotic, a lot of people start seeing that. Uh, In terms of the product, there's also evolutions that have to happen because Initially, it's fine for engineering and product to just focus on getting new things out so that the customer sees more and more value in the product. But once you start getting 
larger customers and big customers, and especially if you're uh, serving businesses, you need to start paying attention to things like scalability, like performance, like making sure that there are tools for the customers to configure the product. It's not just the end features. And that needs a change in approach to how the team is developing and how they are prioritizing. And it has to be done in a way that's kind of planned. Otherwise, you may end up with a product that has a lot of features and starts breaking because it wasn't designed uh, to be scalable enough to take on so many new customers. So there's uh, changes pretty much in every area of the company that need to start happening. And uh, I think that the companies that don't realize that are the ones that start running into trouble. And I do have some ex um, uh, examples of companies that actually were very successful at the beginning, didn't pay attention to that and failed because when they are faced with fast growth, they don't have the performance and they start failing. So I am able to kind of start the story with where companies typically are when they are starting to face that fast growth. And it is very typical. So many of the people in the audience kind of say, yes, that's us. That's exactly what's happening. <laughs> I, I've been nodding. You can't see me, but I've been nodding my head this entire time because on a personal level, as a founder, I can so relate to that feeling of the, the things that used to work on a smaller, more agile team aren't working as we scale and scale and scale. So I, I feel you. And <laughs> but yes, it's so powerful to, to hear that that personal connection from the start. I noticed, too, you're using second person point of view to say, you, you might experience this. You might be feeling this. You might be along this trajectory. And I've seen so many others like you uh, experience these same right. shifts. Thank you for sharing the, uh, some insight into that. I, I also just think it's um so powerful for startups to be able to hear the experiences that others have gone through um, and and see where the failures have happened and try to learn from them too to make to make failure something we're more comfortable talking about in order to produce more rapid learning. Uh, what are your thoughts sort of on how we create innovation cultures that are more comfortable with talking about failures? Uh, well, I think Silicon Valley has really promoted that. So I think that there's a lot about yeah. that. I think that in, in many ways, there's a need for a balance. Um, I, um, I believe that sometimes the idea that failure is good and just go fail fast actually may be counterproductive because it kind of allows for people to not think through, do enough of kind of their understanding of what is the problem that they are solving and whether is it a big problem. And so there's kind of a balance. You want people to be willing to try new ideas, but I don't think that it you want to encourage uh, something that is like, just try whatever, and if it fails, it fails, and we'll try the next thing. I'm particularly aware of that because I work on software for business to business. You cannot just throw stuff at businesses because there's a cost of failure and the cost of failure yes. is there for the customers as well. A customer that is willing to try your solution is going to have to invest time and resources. And so you want to make sure that you and your team are doing as much research and analysis and understanding before throwing something out. So I think that, uh, I absolutely believe that people should not be penalized if they fail by trying something. But I do think that it's important to make sure that you are encouraging people to make, do their due diligence, to really try to understand before just kind of throwing and seeing if it sticks. Yes, I couldn't agree more. We at Untold, we work with quite a few health tech startups, and especially in healthcare, the move fast, break yes. things philosophy is dangerous. You know, we're talking about people's lives and their health and their well being. And so, um, you know, that really sort of goes against the Hippocratic oath to do no harm. Right. And so, we have to give a lot of thought and, and, and carefully consider what risks are worth taking. And um, I think there's still, I do believe there's still ways to move fast, but be comprehensive, I guess, about how we assess whether something is, is worth Yes, scale. there are ways of testing things and validating things. And you're absolutely right that depending on the industry, you have to be more or less conservative. I think that a lot of the concept of just move fast, break things fast, 
is very applicable to direct to consumer, where consumers try something, they either like it or not, but there are not very much negative consequences. As you start moving into more complex software for companies and then kind of all the way into things like healthcare, it has to be done uh, differently. There has to be a lot more sort of understanding and planning. Um, but it doesn't mean that you cannot try new things and that you cannot innovate. Completely agree. Tell us about some of the innovation stories, um, either coming out of Lever, different strategies you're using to communicate your innovations to potential customers and what seems to be resonating, um, or perhaps coming out of leading women in technology. Uh, yeah, I actually probably have two interesting stories. One is actually coming from back in the days when I was in speech recognition, uh, when today speech recognition is ubiquitous, right? You have it on your phone, you have it in your Yes. Home assistant, everybody speaks to their machines. There's nothing strange about that. When I first started in speech recognition, we were really the pioneers. It was a very kind of strange thing to do, to think that you would speak to your phone and the phone would understand and respond. Uh, so we were building out speech recognition systems, speaker verification system to verify who you were based on your voice. And uh, we were selling those systems to large organizations to help them with their um, automated customer care. Uh, instead of having the press one, press two, press three, you would be able to speak to the system. And instead of having to remember a password, or you would have, you just would say uh, it's Laura Marino, and the system would recognize that it was me. Uh, but it was such a novel thing in selling this to banks that were very, very conservative or, or large organizations that were very conservative was difficult. And so really, it was very much about telling the story of what their customers' experience was. And we would be kind of telling them, like, do you know what the experience is for me as a customer of a bank when I call into your system and I go through 10 different menus of press one if you want this, <laughs> press two if you want this, now pre enter your uh, um, passcode, which I never remember. So it, it was a really painful experience. And so we had to kind of remind them of this is what you have today. This is what your customers are experiencing today when they call your bank. Now let's look at what the experience could be like if I can call in and I say, this is Laura Marino, or this is my, my phone number. And with that, you already know that it is me. And then I can go and say, I need to know what my balance is, or I need to know what, what, how much credit is left in my credit card. How much easier is that? And so that's what started being compelling. And again, we were really pioneering something that people didn't believe. But being able to tell the story from the perspective of how painful it was what they had encouraged them to say, yes, let's try this. We need to see if we can improve the life of our end customers. Yes. Yeah, so always keeping your customers, yeah. customers, customer yes. uh, in mind, right? Because that if that's not their priority, then they're probably missing right. something. Yeah. And, and it always should be their priority. So making their hero yours and being able to extrapolate the value and at the same time show value to uh, to them directly as well. So you're kind of, especially in B2B, there's always that additional layer of communication you have to be thinking about. That's right. Um, the other piece, and you were asking about leading women in technology, and um, leading women in technology offers a year-long program that women go through, and we bring expert speakers who help women with a bunch of different things, like how to project credibility, how to be better at change management, how to increase confidence so that you can step up to do more. But one of the things that to me is very interesting is one of our best speakers, Carol Isosaki, she talks about how women can step up and uh, really feel confident that they can speak up and have a bigger role. And I think that what makes her session so powerful is that she tells her own story. And you look at her and she's this amazing charismatic woman, but she tells this story of her being a really, really shy young woman who would not even lift up her face to say hi to people because she was so shy. <laughs> and she walks you through kind of what her what it was, what woke her up, how she changed. And that story, 
what happens with that is that it makes it real for the women in the room saying, if she was able to change that way, of course I can change and I can use the tools that she's giving me to improve. But I think that if she just gave the tools without telling her story, the women in the room would not necessarily feel that, oh, I can do it too. I can go and yes. change. And I think that that's where I see kind of in my mind an example of a really powerful story uh, because it it really encourages people to action. It's not just like, oh yeah, I got this great list of tools of things that I should do and I probably should try them. They walk away saying, hey, this does make a huge difference. It, it takes so much vulnerability to admit to the things that we're afraid of in front of other people. But I think that's also where we generate the best kinds of mentorships and relationships is when we're there for one another and uh, we feel as though we can be candid about the things that we've struggled with or the times where we felt like an outsider. Uh, I love the mission of leading women in technology because it seems like you're tackling some of those uh, challenges head on. Right. And it's been a great program. Uh, again, it's not just targeted for women who are in technology. That's kind of a bit of a legacy. But we have women who are lawyers, women who are accountants, but they all are dealing with the reality that they may be working in organizations where women don't have enough a say, that women are not in leadership. And partly it's because they don't know how to actually go and ask for that, how to present themselves as being the logical choice for the next opportunity in leadership. I see. And so it's really quite a bit of uh, practical advice about breaking down some of the systematic um, oppressions, honestly, that, ha that have been in place for so long um, that have sort of made it more challenging for women to rise into leadership positions, uh, not only, but especially in uh, STEM and technology yes. fields. Yes, because there's a minority of women. And some of the limitations, I would say, are self-imposed by women because of our culture, our tradition, and so on. So I think that it is important to, uh, first of all, realize what are the things that sometimes hold us back. And it's not necessarily that you have a male coworker who's more aggressive. It's just that his attitude towards things is different than yours, having been raised as a woman. And if you start realizing a little bit those differences, you can start addressing that. You'll probably appreciate this, but at, at Untold, we recently collaborated with uh, one of our clients, Crossover Health in Silicon Valley, and we conducted the first uh, meta-analysis on imposter syndrome, or what the medical literature calls imposter phenomenon, and uh, found that it uh, equally impacts men and women, and that it even more so impacts uh, minorities. Right that to feel like an imposter in your professional life. And the other interesting finding was that it's it's age independent. So it doesn't matter if you're a young professional or if you're at the end of your career, you'll still you still have um, a proclivity to be, you know having feelings of being an imposter. Absolutely. I think that that is true and I do believe that that's true for male and female as well. Um, I think that in my career what I have learned is that it's very very powerful to have uh, male allies. I was very fortunate in my career that I not only had of course, the support of my parents and then my husband was incredibly supportive but in a lot of kind of my early stage of the career i worked with vps of engineering and research who were just so uh, kind of supportive of me and i look back and i think that that's one of the things that gave me the confidence to really kind of continue uh moving forward in my career and so i think that there's a whole uh to be said about women also figuring out how to find and create those male allies who will be supportive and helpful and who them, themselves may be struggling with some of those same kind of imposter syndrome uh, challenges. Yes, yes. I, and I think there's so much responsibility too as, as we grow into successful pro professionals and have more responsibilities or perhaps are managing or leading others to continue to make it part of our mission to encourage them and to trust their judgments and uh, to mentor without micromanaging, right. it, you know, because I think we all, um, those of those of us who care so much about the work that we do, we're, we're going to have the proclivity toward 
uh, feeling, you know, self-judgment and uh, criticizing and sort of worrying about whether we are meant to be where we are. And if that is also coming from our mentors or our leaders or our managers, then it, it just sort of quadruples the effect of, of our self-doubt and really trying to find those mentors and, and uh, managers and leaders and essentially prioritizing that as an area where leaders can continue to grow and, and help make imposter syndrome a little more uh, understood and uh, and not ignore the way that it has such a such a strong impact on our productivity. And I think that there is a lot to be said about a type of management that's supportive, but it's also that tends to challenge people to do more. Because if, if as a manager, you're supportive of the person, convince them like you're here because we thought you were good enough to be here, but now I believe that you can do even more. That's a way to challenge them to try more but knowing that they have support. And I think that that's where you really can stretch people and get them to become more confident if they are successful in doing something that was bigger than they initially thought, but they are not terrified of if I fail, I'm going to get fired. That's where people start feeling comfortable saying, oh, I can do it. I'll try. I think I can do it. And, and there's a lot on the management to really encourage that type of attitude. I love that. Do you have any other advice that you would give to innovators as, as they prepare to share their great ideas? Um, I think you mentioned something about being vulnerable. I think that there's a balance between as a, as a leader, you want to come through as confident. You need to come through as passionate. And if you don't show the passion for what you're doing, it's going to be very hard for a team to want to follow you. But at the same time, they need to know that you are approachable and that you're vulnerable, that you are not kind of the one who knows everything, but that instead, as a team, the team is going to be able to succeed. And as a leader, the leader is there to guide, to be the sounding board, to provide direction, but is not the person who's going to be just telling them exactly what to do and judging them if they are not uh, doing it in the right way. So I would say that kind of for the leaders that are trying to promote innovation, to encourage a team to do something that may be difficult and new and hard, I think is you need to show the passion, you need to show the empathy, you need to tell the story of why this is important, why there's going to be impact. And then you need to make the team feel that they are empowered but supported. Absolutely. That is that is so powerful. Laura, thank you so much for this conversation. I'm, I'm so grateful that we got to chat. And um, if you are interested, you can follow uh, on social media at Lever App, and you can follow LWT Leadership to learn more about leading women in technology. And Laura Marino, I'm so uh, excited to continue learning more from you. And I'm grateful for the time that you've given to the innovation community today with your thoughts. Thank you, Katie. And thank you for your entire organization. I think that you're doing a great job just kind of promoting these conversations. Thank you, Laura. Talk soon. Okay. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to this week's episode. Be sure to follow us on social media and add your voice to the conversation. You can find us at Untold Content.